There's no deceiver more effective than a public school educated Brit. He could be standing next to you in a bus queue, having a forced 12 nervous breakdown, and you'd never be any the wiser. My name is Piers, and I am a boarding school survivor. And I'm on a journey to understand the impact that boarding school has had on me and the thousands and hundreds of thousands of men and women who have been through boarding school. Behind me are the gates to my school. This is the road we used to drive up. And I was here for seven years of my childhood. This is the first time I've been back in 25 years because what happened behind here was deeply upsetting and deeply painful. So today I've come back to try and explore some of these things. What did happen? Children are abandoned. There was no communication with home at all in the first three years, other than censored letter writing. They're bereaved. And I get told my dad's died. And then I get made to play the match the next day. And then I get publicly shamed by the teacher for not concentrating. And they live a life of captivity. When I was 11 years old, and I was stalked by a boy who held a knife to my throat and would jump out of bushes at night when I was walking along. Their freedom of expression is limited. We are a nation addicted to cover-up. And to, so many leaders of our nation went to schools where they saw this cover-up happen, where, it, where the, the good of this, the good reputation of the great college, you know, that's what came first. And the fact that Mr. Smithers was raping children, that shouldn't come out because it might affect the institution. And the D is the disassociation, which is a result of that. And that's what causes boarding school syndrome. You know, I have friends who, who have severe PTSD and, you know, have to cower in a bathtub, in a cold bath, to try and get rid of these, these terrors. I know of a number of people who were sent to boarding school at six. What you've brought from home that's a real comfort is your teddy bear. And your teddy makes you feel safe, and then the other boys steal it because they can use it to laugh at you with. And they hang it maybe on the gutter outside your window where you can never reach it again, but you are always able to see it. Every single child, when they arrive in a boarding institution, they have to survive. And about half an hour after we'd been put to bed, this housemaster appeared and just asked quite calmly whether anyone was still awake. So we all admitted we were, and he said, follow me. And um, he took us upstairs, locked our heads under a snooker table and beat the hell out of us with a cue. There's people at boarding school who, who don't survive it, actually. And then it was a boy at my school who killed himself. And mine too. Called Rick, who was three years older than me. I'd met him before I went to school and he said he'd look out for me. So we all filled up the chapel and we sat there wondering. We waited for ages. After a while, the headmaster walked in, solemn. He took a breath, he looked around and he says, I've got some really sad news to tell you all. The boy that we all know, Richard, has committed suicide. Richard had thrown himself in front of the train and killed himself. But yeah, it really fucking hurt when you died. I wanted to commit suicide myself. And of course, a lot of people when they come out of boarding school go completely crazy. I'd started to think I was going insane. I leaned over the bridge and I wondered if anyone would notice if I jumped. It's hard to manage that grief when you're an adult on your own. I don't think you can do it on your own. You needed someone to help you to do it when you were a little child. And one day when I was really deeply depressed and suicidal, I went into the priest's house and I said, I need to speak to you. He didn't seem interested in listening to me speak. 
What he said was, you need a massage. I'm like, well, he's an adult, he must know. So I went up to his bedroom. He sat on his bed. He placed me, sat on the floor, facing away from him. My head pressed against his groin, and he started to massage me. There was this person who is now in, is now in jail, right, for abusing young, young kids, and who I knew was grooming friends of mine. So three of the pupils in that photograph, 50 or I think it's 56 in that photograph, three of those had been sexually abused by a martyr, master who's also in the photograph. I can name 17 that were abused by the same master, including our, us three. Six of my actual teachers are, have either served time in prison or are in prison at the moment for sexual offences against the children. And a further five were then caught later on in other schools. That's 11 teachers. Alex Renton says 1,100 serious allegations have been given to him that he has on a database for over 300 schools, 80% of which are boarding schools. How many adults were able to pursue a career of teaching in boarding schools where they were known to be a risk to the children? And the question is, so many of our leaders have been to institutions like these for hundreds of years. What's the impact? The path from Britain's boarding schools to the highest echelons of government is well trodden. But are these elite establishments producing bad leaders? Modern politics is based on a collective immersion in dishonesty, deception, manipulation. If, if somebody murdered and lied as blithely as these people do, in ordinary life they'd be seen as criminals. Rupert Murdoch has been described as having really terrible impact on the journalism of Britain. Rupert Murdoch had a terrible story in boarding school. And maybe people don't know that. And this is something I really want to explore and understand, not just for those leaders, but how it impacts those people of this country. What could the average person do? They could wake up to their own sense of passivity and lack of power and really ask themselves, do I really want to be manipulated and controlled by people who are so troubled that they have no compunction about killing people anywhere in the world? Trauma will often facilitate an enhanced desire or trajectory which takes one on a on a healing journey. I spent five weeks in a clinic in Bedfordshire. Um, I call it my funny holiday. Um, it was anything but funny. And um, to my astonishment, they cured me of my anger and my hatred. We could heal some of the pain that has been caused by British culture over a number of centuries. We could heal that even yet. We do that by starting to pay attention to the suffering of children. So I think there's something stirring in the undergrowth and I hope it's not just a, a whimper. I hope it's a lion waiting to roar.